If you have your Bibles this morning, I, and I trust that you do, that you'll open them to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, I appreciate the good sunshine, good weather we've had. Amen? And uh, we, we went through our, as some of y'all would say, well, we've, we had winter. I, I'm satisfied with what we had. And, uh, and yet we know we've got a couple months left, right? And even sometimes March can be a little dicey. Yep. And so... Uh, I, was, I was kind of afraid of you last night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I did try to get... Uh, I told you, you know, I don't hang out and, on New Year's Eve and so forth. Don't do that. I tried to, uh, to get to bed at a reasonable time, but my neighbors decided to be up, and man, it was like World War Three out here. <laughs> And so, uh, but I, you know, I can appreciate a good celebration. If, if that's what it's like on New Year's, no telling what July 4th would be like if, if, they, if they permit it. But, um, but anyway, but I appreciate you being here today. And, uh, and we're so, I, I've just been looking forward to delivering this, uh, something that I think that will help us. But let's begin reading here in John chapter 15 and beginning in verse 1. The Lord Jesus here is speaking, and he said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. And then verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me... You can do nothing. Wow. I, I want to speak to you, particularly as we enter this new year, uh, I want to talk to you about abiding in Him. Abiding in Him. And so let's pray one more time. Father, I sure do thank you for these dear saints, Lord, and I pray you'll, while I'm speaking on the outside, Father, the Holy Spirit will speak to them on the inside. Bless our time together, Father, around your word. I know that it will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish the purpose whereunto you have sent it. And so, Lord, I need you this morning, as this verse has told us, that without you we can do nothing. Without you, Father, I, I cannot communicate your truth. don't have the power, Lord, but you do. And I'm asking for your help today. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. I, I don't know about you, but I would just say this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not much on resolutions. You know, a lot of people, they always come up with stuff, you know, the end of December and the first parts of, of January, they make resolutions. And usually by about the third week or so, if they were really diligent, it might last until the fourth week. Amen. <laughs> and then they go like, well, I'll, I'll try to get in February. All right. Yeah, no. You know, so, and, and the Bible even says in the book of Ecclesiastes, it warns us about vowing vows because God marks your mouth. And so, uh, and so the idea here is it, it said it'd be better for you not to vow than to have vowed and not kept it. And so uh, you, you, when you kind of, con you have to consider that we're going to have to give an account for every idle word. And uh, you think about all the idle words. I, I remember a, a preacher friend had a poster in his office and it said, what if, what if every word you said was, if, if, what if every word you spoke was being recorded? And, uh, and it had a picture of an old time tape recorder on there and it said at the bottom of that poster, it said, well, in fact, it is being recorded. And that is true, every idle word. And so... So I don't, I, don't, I don't like to make vows, but, but if you're like me, I would like to do better this year than I did last year by the grace of God. And uh, I'd like to walk a little closer to the Lord this year. When I say that, I'm talking about 
more consistently than I did this past year. I, I, David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It's the verse that I had put in the bulletin this time. And uh, I'd like to do that more consistently, wouldn't you? To bring glory and honor to his name. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so the Lord here in this passage, in these five verses, and we'll look at some others here as well, uh, gives us the recipe for doing this, abiding in Christ. How to abide in Him, all right? So let's take a look, all right? Shall we do that? I want you to see the first thing. If you and I are going to abide, notice how he puts this. He uses a parable here, if you will, one of those metaphors. And he says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. How many of you all have ever raised tomatoes? And uh, tomatoes, they get a little something. You'll get a branch on there. And, uh, and then next thing you know, in between the branch, like right in the fork, right? Between the main stem and the little branch, there's another little thing. After, you know, after a length of time, a little shoot comes out of there. What do we call those? They're called suckers. And why do they call that? Because they're sucking all the nutrients out and they never produce any fruit. All right? Well, the first thing in abiding, it has to do with pruning, pruning. And that's what, that's what that passage is speaking about. He taketh away and God wants us to examine kind of like, kind of like that tomato plant, if you will, to remove the suckers from our life. Pruning is done in the botanical world to remove the dead things, if you will, or the things that don't produce anything. And these might be, uh, you know, th th this, these are, are, are things that get in the way of, of feeding, if you will, the fruit that is to be born by the plant. And so we don't want to have anything in our lives that is taking some time away. You know, the, the Bible says this that in the book of Proverbs, it says much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that that is destroyed for want of judgment. So these people are working hard, they're just not working smart. And you know, slothfulness, beloved, is not measured by the amount of inactivity a person might be involved in. Slothfulness is really occupying, can be, can be measured in terms of occupying our time with things that don't matter, with things that in other words, what's happening is we're spending time doing other things where the things that need to be done are not getting done. People say, well, I, oh, I'm a busy person. Well, busy doing what? You got to be busy about doing the what? Doing the right things. You know, if, if, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we always got to do everything that we like to do? <laughs> but, but that's not reality. That's not reality. And so the Lord wants to prune some things because pruning not only removes some of those dead things, things that don't produce, but it also, pruning also stimulates new growth. I know uh, around February or so, I'm not sure about over here, but February back in East Texas, you know, that's the time when you start pruning back the crepe myrtles. So, do they grow crepe myrtles here? I, maybe it might be too cold. I don't, I don't know. But, uh, but that's the time that you do that. And when you do that, you, what actually you're doing, you're, you're, clearing away all the dead things, but you're also helping them. They call it when they make their bones. When, uh, when crepe myrtles make bones, in other words, the stalks get, the stems get stronger and they get thicker and so forth. It's able to support more. And so God, uh, beloved, does some pruning in our lives, you know, because you don't want to be guilty of just working hard without working smart. You know, you don't want to be like the two brothers that decided to sell water melons for a living. You know, they got them a truck and, uh, they had a little discussion about that. They got a truck and they so they tried to find watermelons at a good price and they bought them for a dollar and they sold them for a dollar. And, uh, and so they worked very hard for about a week and got rid of all their melons and they, they counted the money and they said, man, we didn't make anything. We didn't make one cent over this. And the other brother said, well, I told you at the beginning when we were talking about trucks that we needed a bigger truck. Man, you and I, we don't want to be doing that kind of thinking. Amen? Amen. 
We don't want to be doing that kind of thinking. And so God likes to prune a little bit. You know, businesses do this. They don't call it that. What they do is they call it a survey. They send it to you. How, you know, hey, you got this thing delivered. How did that go? Uh, did, how did you find out about us? They're doing that. What are they doing? They, they, are, they are looking and examining to see how are their advertising dollars being spent and which advertising effort is producing the most fruit. And the things that are not producing fruit, I'll guarantee you, they're not going to repeat in 2023. Why? Because it wasn't productive. And so too it is about our lives, beloved. You know, when you and I got saved, Paul said this. He said this in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so as we get older in life, it's not about going back. Man, you know, you got to put down the toy box and you pick up the toolbox. And so it is with our lives, beloved, that, that God wants us to take a look at these things. You know, you can be busy about, about the wrong things and be guilty of slothfulness because the right things are not being done. Hebrews 12 says this, to lay aside every weight and these sin that does so easily beset us. Weights are not sins, but weights are things that hinder us from running a good race. Do you remember in school, the basketball players, when you were in high school, all those boys that looked like they could hide in the shadow of a clothesline? And uh, I wrestled in high school. I wasn't a basketball player. But, uh, but my point is, is that they would wear these ankle bracelets. You remember seeing those? They would have those little bags of sand around their ankles. And uh, those were weights that they had on there. They would wear that all day during the day. But prior to the game, they were going to have that evening or whatever. When the evening time came around, they laid aside those weights. They took those weights off. Why? They could run a little faster. They felt lighter. They could jump higher because they'd gotten accustomed to the, having that heavier weight upon their legs. And, uh, and so too it is with, with us. God wants us to lay aside the things that hinder us from, from running our race swiftly and efficiently. Because, I mean, don't you want to finish your course? Amen. amen, I do. I want to be here for the last amen. And to finish my course with joy, I want to be able to do that. And so the Lord wants us to lay aside the little entanglements, the distractions that produce nothing. Now listen, you know, there was, there's an old saying, and I know y'all know this. It says, all work and no play makes Jack or Ed a dull boy. All right? So you, you have to have some amusements. There has to be a little entertainment in, the, in life, but that doesn't mean that we live for those pursuits. We shouldn't. We've got to keep our priorities right. So the Lord clips away some of these things. How does he do it? How do you do it? Man, I got some pruning shears. And I, I, was, I, I told Sister Joan, I actually, I actually saw my cedar smoke. Is that what we called it? No, cedars of fire. Cedars of fire yesterday morning. It was a little bit cool. And I, I let the dog out, and I looked out there, and poof, man, there it was. I mean, a big cloud. And, I, of course, I hollered to Debbie, I, you know, because I said, hey, hey, I, I saw it. And, you know, she was like, you saw what? And I said, hey, I saw that, that puff of smoke out there. And, and, uh, and, uh, and she said, well, I'm going to get the camera. I, I'm going to get my phone. I want to take a picture. And I, it doesn't take much to entertain us, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, all right, get the camera. And so I went out there, and I got a stick. All right, I took the end of the of the the Swiffer handle, and I went out there, and man, so I just started, the neighbors probably thought the preacher has lost his mind. Anyway, I was out there, I was hitting those limbs, and then poof, I was making more poofs come off of there, so she could get a picture of it, and uh, and I said all that just to say that, you know, we, we use, you know, we use some, some trimmers, some clippers, sometimes they're little hand uh, pruning shears like this, sometimes they have to be long handled to reach a little more, they can handle a little thicker limb and so forth. But nonetheless, it's got to be done. And God uses some things in our lives to help prune away. Well, what does he do? Sometimes it's through preaching. Sometimes it's through the exhortation for us to think about some things that, that possibly we hadn't given any, any thought to or maybe not the right kind of thought or maybe not giving it the right kind of weight in our lives. So he uses preaching sometimes, exhortations and reproving and even rebuking. Sometimes it comes in your daily devotions. 
As you read the word of God, what does it do? It does a little surgery on the heart, doesn't it? Removes some things that need to be removed. It clips away. That's why the Bible says that the word of God is quick and powerful. Hebrews 4 and 12 is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the joints of the marrow and of the soul and spirit. Now watch this. And I love this part about it. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's just something about the old black book. It can discern the thoughts and intents, the motives in your life. And when they're not right, God wants to prune that away, to trim it away. And, uh, and so it's a part, it's a part of what's necessary if you and I are going to do what the passage says. Because, you know, we talked about being a fruitful Christian. Being more consistent, look, look, what, look what verse 2 says. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Why is he pruning it? He's trying to stimulate some growth. He's trying to create it where that plant can produce. Where that branch. Well, let me rephrase that. The vine produces the fruit. The branch is supposed to bear it. I'll, I'll make that a little more clear in just a little bit. But he wants there to be fruit on those branches. And he prunes that away because it's not being used like it was intended to be used. It's not bearing the fruit to carry it. And barrenness is, was never a good thing in the Bible. Barrenness. And... Uh, and so God wants us to be fruitful. Notice what it says. He said, look at the latter part of that verse. In every branch that beareth fruit, he's going to do something to that one. He purgeth it that it what? That it may bring forth more fruit. More fruit. So you got fruit, then you got more fruit, then you got God's glorified by much fruit. So, so this pruning that the Lord does, sometimes it's reproving, sometimes it's in our daily devotions. Sometimes it's through a friend. It can be through a friend who loves you and cares about you. The Bible says in the, in the book of Proverbs in chapter 27, it says open rebuke is better than secret love. I've been rebuked by a friend before. Uh, you know, a, a man that I respected and I went to see him and he was preaching in the area and I visited with him a little bit and he wanted to know how I was doing. And man, I started down a road and I, next thing you know, I'm kind of crying a little bit. And man, he re, he's, man, he listened to that for all of about maybe three seconds. And, uh, and he looked at me in the face and he, he put his finger in my face and he said, you shut up. He said, God's been good to you. You don't have any reason to be belly aching like you're doing right now. Woo. That's Brother Ron Garris. He was the guy that was over Rock of Ages prison ministry. And man, those tears in my face, they were trying to beat up. They were trying to burn a path getting back to my eyes. I mean... If I could have. But sometimes a friend will do that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And why did he do it? Because he loved me. Because he cared about me. And someone may come along and maybe, you know, rub the cat the wrong way. Why? Try to get your attention. They want to see you make progress. They want to see you be fruitful. Don't you want to be fruitful this year? Sure. I know that you do. The Bible says this, as iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. It is that friction sometimes. I got a knife sharpener in there, man. I'm sure the blade doesn't appreciate it while it's going through there. The boy puts an edge on there. Sometimes initially when a friend does that to you, you may not appreciate it. But if you'll go home and think about it and pray about it, and meditate on it. Go to the word of God. You'll find out. Hey, you know what? Why did they do that? I mean, why did your parents correct you? Now, sometimes they did it for their own pleasure. Their reputations meant more than their relationship. But I think down deep, I mean, just like you, didn't you want, didn't you want to see your children do better than what you have done? Absolutely. So why? So you corrected them because you loved them. That's why, that's why. And I, 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 you know, if you don't know it, I want you to know God loves you and, uh, and wants, wants to fruit to be born by us, to be carried by us. 
And so look at the latter part of that verse. So there's the pruning that takes place. If you and I are going to be do things more consistently to, to, if you will, to be more fruitful in our lives, then we're going to have to endure some pruning. Some pruning. But I want you to see also there's some purging that takes place. Look at the latter part of that verse. And he said that every, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. That it may do what? That it may bring forth more fruit. And he gives us what purging means. Usually when we think about purging, we, we think about, you know, um, we may think about somebody that's got, got a, an eating disorder or whatever. They purge, they binge and purge. That's not what purging means here. Purging means here to be cleansed, to be cleansed. I've, I've had some plants that got something on them and I had to, they were a holly and I had to go out there with a certain kind of soap or whatever. It was some sort of little parasite that got on there and I had to spray these things down. What was I doing? All I was doing was cleaning the leaves so that there would be nothing that would hinder that light uh, from coming in to be absorbed, so it would that would produce the chlorophyll, which would strengthen the plant. And so, so purging, Jesus gives us the meaning in verse three. Notice what he says: "Now ye are clean through what through the word which I have spoken unto you." God, in order to purge us, God uses His word. It is the cleansing power of the word of God. What the Lord Jesus, listen to this in Ephesians five. It says of the Lord that he might sanctify and cleanse it. The it there is the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, by the word of God. And it is through the word of God, beloved, that our lives are cleansed, that we get cleaned up. And Jesus said that purging is taking place through the word which he had spoken unto them. They were not the same as they were when they first met, whether it was alongside the Sea of Galilee or he was at the, or Matthew at the receipt of custom. He was a publican in the lives of those men, Nathaniel under a tree and Andrew and so forth. Their lives were changing. Why? As a result of being near him, being around him to the point, you remember when they got in trouble over there in the book of Acts, chapter four, and verse 13, it said that, that they, they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but they could tell that they had been with Jesus. Amen. And so through the cleansing of the word, the cleansing power of the word of God. So, so there are some things here. You and I, we need to receive it meekly. That's what James 1 says, receive with meekness. And so receiving means an appetite and an attitude that, Lord, I have a desire for this word. I want the word of God in my life. I want a working knowledge of the word of God that I know how to apply it. That I can measure the, if you will, measure things by it and through it. Because that is that is the filter that you and I are to look at this world. Do, do you have a biblical perspective of the world? You have to ask yourself, do you have a biblical perspective about life? You know, when I, when I was serving and I'm still on the on the books as being the chaplain for the East Montgomery County Fire Department. They wouldn't let me resign when I moved over here and I appreciate that. But one of the things that I would told them, I said, you know, when I would meet them, I said, listen, I, I'm a Bible person. I said, I don't, I, I don't know how to answer the issues of life apart from the word of God. And, uh, you know, I, I would have to tell a few of them, listen, I'm not, I don't sell Venetian blinds and light bulbs. I'm the chaplain. I'm a preacher. That means you're going to get the Bible. If you ask me a question, I'm going to give you a Bible answer. Do my best to give you one based upon the word of God. And beloved, the same thing is, needs to be true of each of us, that we have a biblical perspective of the world. And so that means that we understand that we receive it. And then, and then we want it to dwell in our heart richly. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, unto all wisdom. You, you've been discussing that in the ladies' class. We've been discussing the book of Proverbs in the men's class. And both of them have to do with receiving wisdom, getting wisdom in this world. But there has to be the preparation of our heart for that. That we live and walk with some humility. I told Brother Ed this morning, or I asked him, I said, when it rains around here, where does the water go? And he said, well, it goes to the lowest places. And I said, that's right. I said, it will fill the lowest places first. 
And when you and I humble ourselves, then God can fill us. But it's when we think too much of ourselves, we're not going to get the wisdom that we must have. Let it dwell in, in you richly. You won't need a WWJD bracelet. You remember when those were coming out? You got to have that on your arm. What would Jesus do? No, you'd already know if you read the Bible, you'll know what Jesus would do. Amen. You begin to think like God. You'll have the mind of God. And he wants us to have that. That's why he recorded it for us in his word. And Paul even wrote and said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let it, allow it, pursue it. Number three, practice it daily. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You know, when uh, what good would it be to, uh, uh, Brother Ed, you just have to bear with me here. What good would it be to do to go, to go to medical school, get a license to practice medicine, put a shingle out there and put MD behind your name and then never show up to the office? What would that, what would that, That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? To go to school and then never practice. Well, what if Spencer to go, to spent all that time and gone to law school and then never come out and practice? Wouldn't that have been foolish? I can't imagine that happening. <laughs> but but, but you'd, be, you'd be surprised, though, when it comes to the Word of God. They may read it, but they don't ever practice it. I think we know a lot more than what we actually do. And beloved, in 2023, we ought to try to change that. Be a doer of it. Not a hearer only. Because then it says you just look at yourself in the mirror and then you walk away and you forget what image you saw. I'm glad y'all didn't do that this morning. Amen? Some of y'all put a brush in your hair. Some of y'all put a brush in your teeth. Maybe you put, you put your teeth in. I don't know. Amen? Maybe you did. But you didn't look in the mirror and say, gee, how... How did, how did my neighbor get in here? No, that was you. Amen. And what? And you did something about it. When you read the word of God, it's a mirror. And when it shows you those things, you've got to do something about it, beloved. If we're going to submit ourselves to the purging, to the cleansing that God wants to work in our lives. And those are choices that you and I make. He, he, he gave us a will, did he not? He did. Receive it with meekness. Let it dwell in your heart richly. Practice it daily. Hold it forth faithfully. Do you remember in pioneer days? I know y'all are old, but you're not that old, all right? But pioneer days, if they had a lantern, what would they do with it? They would hold it out here like this, right? Holding it forth. Well, it would light the path for them. And that's what God wants us to do. You know, he wants us to hold it forth. Holding forth the word of life as we have been taught. Why? That we might walk in that light. Some clever person said this. He said, when it comes to the Bible, you ought to study it. And then you ought to stow it. Hide it in your heart. And then you ought to show it. <laughs> and let others see that it's a part of your life. And then you need to sow it. Spread it around. I just got a few things here. Hey, hold it forth. Hold it forth. I'm telling you, because what does it do? It not only lights a path for you, but it also helps light a path for others. And beloved, we live in some dark times, do we not? It's Listen, the Bible is the only thing, if you'll give it away, more of it will stick to you. As you give it away, it will stick to you. Why? Because you're using it. You're practicing it. You're applying it. You're giving it out. And then when somebody says something, the Holy Spirit on the inside says, oh, no, that's not the truth. This is the truth. He may tell you to speak that or he may tell you this is not the time to open your mouth. Either way, you've got to listen to him. Amen? You need to listen to him. Receive it. Let it dwell in your heart richly. Practice it daily. Hold it forth faithfully. Because the Holy Spirit will lead you by it. And the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And God uses his word through his spirit to lead us. 
Then let me give you the last thing. The last thing. Not only does the Lord want to prune some things in our lives, not only does he want to purge some things, so there's pruning and purging, but I want you to look in verse 4 with me. There is the positioning. The positioning. Look at it with me. Abide in me. That word abide means to dwell, to remain, to reside, to continue. It's a word that, you know, that a lot of people don't use anymore. Sometimes they say, bide your time. You've heard that, right? That means to be patient. It means to wait. And the word abide has to do with remaining and staying. It's where you dwell. If I were to ask you, man, what do we say in America? Hey, where do you live? Or in, uh, in, in uh, South Louisiana, they say, where do you stay? Where do you stay? Well, standing right here. No, no, no. Where do you stay? That's, that's their way of saying, where do you live? But it's where you stay, where you remain, your dwelling place. And in order to do that, we've got to do some things. I want you to see this with me. Now, listen, do you, do you think the word abide is used some eight times in 10 verses here in this chapter? Do you think he's trying to make a point by that? abiding abiding it's and it's going to be it's going to be important because notice what it says look at verse 4 abide in me and i in you now he didn't say i will in you he said i'm in you he's going to keep his part of the bargain he's not coming and going as they did in the old testament he wants us to be, if you will, as faithful at that abiding, dwelling, remaining. And what does that take? It's going to take, there's, I've got four little words here, and we're, going to, we're almost done. The first one is the word surrender. If you're going to remain, you're going to have to surrender. Now, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about staying connected to the vine. You know, remember what I said? You know, branches don't produce anything. The sap eventually gets to the branch because the branch is attached to the vine. If you separate that branch from the vine, it has no life-sustaining uh, sap in it. It can't produce anything. That's why Jesus said at the end of verse 5, without me, you can do what? Nothing. So the most important thing in the branch's mind is to stay, is the vine and to stay attached. That's where we need to be. That This year, each and every day as we approach it, that I might abide in him. And that will take a surrender. It takes surrender, beloved. What, is that, what does that simply mean? Surrender simply means that, that we, if you will, that we are yielding ourselves to him, not my will, but his will, not my way, but his way, not my thoughts, but his thoughts are the most important. And when you surrender, that is an act. It's an attitude of the will. You don't want to be like the little boy that was in school. You know, he just wouldn't sit down, wouldn't sit down, wouldn't sit down. Teacher finally sent a note home. Bobby won't sit down. You know, I don't know why I always name that little boy Bobby, you know. But Bobby must have been a bad boy. I don't know. But anyway, Bobby wouldn't sit down. And finally, the teacher sent a note home, said he just will not, he will not mind me. He will not do what he's told. He will not stay seated. And so uh, his parents must have worked him over pretty good because he came the next day. And, uh, and he, was, he sat in his desk and he sat there. And man, she remarked and said, you know, Bobby, I so appreciate how you sat today? And he raised his hand. You know, he said, well, teacher, I just want you to know something. He said, I'm, it may look like I'm sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still standing up. That's not surrender. Okay? When you and I are surrendered, it means that we really understand that he is the vine and that we are the branches. The branches exist for only one reason and one reason only. 
and is to be attached to the vine. It's all about him. It's not about us. Because branches don't produce fruit, as I told you before. They only bear the fruit. We put it on display. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not me trying to imitate something. It's me being attached. It's me abiding and surrendered the fruit then can be produced in our lives. It takes surrender. You have to remember. You say, well, you know, Brother Ed, I, I, I got a job, I got a family, I got this, I got that. But uh, how, how can I have just one issue in life? How can I just have one motive in life? But I got so many things that are pulling on me. Well, that's a choice you have to make because you have to remember what is 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 said? It says that we have been bought with a price and ye are no longer your own. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's. That little apostrophe on that S, if my English grammar uh, serves me here. That means possession. We're his possession. We're no longer our own. I have to be reminded about that. Being self-willed, beloved, is never the way to bear fruit because you won't bear any while you're being self-willed. Surrender, surrender. You won't be fruitful without it. You won't be. You'd like to be. You want to be. But you know, have you ever heard the saying, you know, they cut off their nose to spite their face? That's that working hard, but not working smart. <clears throat> Surrender. The second thing is dependence. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. What can the branch do without the vine? When I prune those uh, cedars over there to make room for us to back in, I noticed those uh, the boughs that I cut off, they, they, they don't have berries on them. And uh, I noticed that they hadn't planted themselves. They didn't hop up and burrow a hole and dig down in there. They're still laying there. They're, you know, it's interesting. You know, it's a tree... Until you, until you cut something off, and then they, what do they call it? They call it timber. And then when it gets processed, they call it lumber. But it ceases to be alive. It's only alive while it's attached to the tree, giving its resources, its nutrients. We've got to focus on him, dependence, dependence. You know, so what can the, what can the branch do without the vine? The answer is zip. Zero, and for you Hispanic, nada. I mean nothing, all right? Nothing. We can't do anything without it. Nothing lasting, nothing spiritual, all right? Over time, absolute surrender becomes absolute dependence. You say, well, I depend on him. Really? When we do that, it doesn't mean that we sit by passively. Okay, Lord, you know, uh, I'm not going to go to work because I'm going to depend upon you today. <laughs> You know, the, God made the birds and showed them how to make a nest, but they still have to get out of there to go after the worm, don't they? Yes, they do. He doesn't rain the worms in the nest. So it's not about being passive here when I say dependent. It just means not being independent as we as independent Baptists like to be. The third one is rest. Rest. Look, at, look with me. <clears throat> at verse 9. Notice what he said. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? And you say, Brother Ed, you don't know me. You just see me at church. You're right. Sometimes people would say, you know, if they really knew me, they, they wouldn't like me. 
That might be so of people, but that's not true of our God. The Bible says that when we were ungodly, when we were unholy, when we were sinners, Christ died for us. He loved you and me when we were unlovely, when we were unholy, when we were at enmity with God. I mean, the Lord Jesus even called Judas friend. And there was nothing, there was nothing. He wasn't acting when he said that. He wasn't putting on a show. He loved him. And beloved, now that you're his child, do you think he loves you? Oh, I, I, think he might, I think he might be sometimes disappointed, grieved with what we do. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He's God in us. But I want you to know that we are loved. You are loved. And you and I, we've got to rest in that. I don't care what a day brings. You know, the Bible says a, a just man falls seven times and he rises again. Nothing can separate us. I mean, in Romans chapter 8, listen, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you. Knowing to whom you belong helps us to rest. And we don't have to wrestle with things. Does he care about me? Does he want me? Well, look what I did. And the devil, what does he do? Yeah, look at you. What kind of Christian are you? Oh, you think God loves you like that? You think, I mean, he is a master of deception and deceiving. That's why the Bible is so important. We've got to trust this book. got to believe the book. You've got to mix faith with what you read and what you hear. You've got to do that. And then look at the last one, and I'll be done. We're talking about abiding. How can I abide? you got to get in on the pruning. you got to examine your life. you got to get in on the purging. What are you doing with the Bible? Number three, you've got to be positioning yourself, surrendering, depending, resting in the love of God. The Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but what? Of power and love and a sound mind. Yeah, a sound mind. Believe it or not, a sound mind is given to us. And the last one, look at verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you. That my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I, I, I skipped a verse. I, I want you to look at verse Look with me in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The, the little fourth thing, the first one was surrender, dependence, rest, and the fourth one is obedience. Obedience. You know, the obedient children in your home, the obedient children were the happiest children. Did you know that? The rebels always got a burr under their saddle. They always got a, a bee in their bonnet over something. That's that, that, that disobedient, that rebellious child, never happy, never satisfied. But that obedient child was the happiest child in your home. I don't know if you were that person or not. You might have thought that you were. Your sister or your siblings might say differently, all right? I don't know. But I just know this, that if you and I, if we will obey, and what did the songwriter said? There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's how it happens. And so look at what he gives us when we're really abiding. This is when I wanted you to go to verse 11. Notice what it says. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. One of the byproducts of you abiding is not only bearing fruit, putting it out on display, but you're going to be happy in your doing of it. That there is real joy. The byproduct of abiding in Christ is joy. And you can have it in 2023. We just have to ask ourselves, 
listen. You know, again, I'm not one for vow and vows, and I'm not going to ask you to vow a vow or, uh, you know. But my point is, hey, you, I, I think we each one, we all can do a little better than we have done. You know, you can't, you can't always live, though it be true, you know, I'm not everything that I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. That's true. Amen. I say amen to that. But we could be a little bit more of what we ought to be. Couldn't we? I believe we can. Ask the Lord to help you with that this year. And just, you know, don't make, well, this is what I'm going to do for the next, no, just relax. <laughs> Abide in Him. Learn to walk with Him. Read His Word. Learn to trust Him. You find Him to be so faithful. He's been faithful over all these years. He's not going to change His mind now. Amen? We can do a little better in 2023. I'd like to, and I know you would too. All right? But there's a way to do it. And the Lord Jesus has given us the recipe here. If we'll just submit ourselves and by the grace of God, follow it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I sure do thank you, Lord, for the word of God. And thank you, Lord, for the vine. Or that means everything to us as branches. And I pray, Father, that we would take our relationship with him so in, that it would just become so preeminent in our life. Not just prominent, but preeminent. And Lord, that we may bear the fruit that you want to produce in and through us. That you may be glorified, Father. That's our motive. We thank you for the joy that comes from serving Jesus Christ. But Lord, our greatest motive, our greatest desire, Lord, is that we may glorify you in this body, and in our spirit, which you have purchased. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for Jesus Christ, Lord. We pray that through our lives this year, this church, Father, we may exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, that we could edify the saints, Lord, and evangelize sinners, that you would receive all the glory and honor. We love you today, and I pray, Father, that your will would be done now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.